Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today I'm pleased to welcome back to our show one of my favorite guests, author Tom Santo Pietro. You've seen him on our show talking about his book, Considering Doris Day, and you've also seen him discussing the ongoing appeal and significance of To Kill a Mockingbird when he was here discussing his book about the novel and the movie. Today, he's here to discuss a legendary star who was widely considered to be the king of show business, Frank Sinatra. Although we usually think of Sinatra as a recording and concert artist, the fact is that he made 61 feature films and was a tremendously gifted actor. Our guest has written a fascinating book entitled Sinatra in Hollywood, The Film Career of a Screen Icon, which not only celebrates the screen legacy of this iconic star, but also delves into his tumultuous marriages, his political involvement, and those persistent rumors of mafia connections. I'm so happy to welcome back Tom Santo Pietro to our show. Tom, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you for having me back. I, I've been looking forward to this interview. Me too. Tom, you've written books about Doris Day, Streisand, Sinatra, To Kill a Mockingbird, The Sound of Music, and The Godfather. How were you able to become an expert about so many people and films? I don't know if I would ever call myself an expert, but I, I think the impulse behind writing a book is that you, there's something that really interests you as the author, it, the idea of this person or this film, and you just want to share it with other people and hope that there are others out there who share this fascination. And that that has been really the greatest reward of writing the books. I mean, of course, it's nice to make you know, some money, but it's the connection with readers who are fascinated by Sinatra the way I am or about Doris Day. That's the, um, that's the joy, really, of writing a book. So what was it about Frank Sinatra that captivated you so much? Well, I, I think with Sinatra, it's that he, his talent is just so overwhelming. And Billy Wilder, you know, who was a tough cookie and one of the greatest directors ever, his quotation was, Frank Sinatra is beyond talent. He, that's how much Billy Wilder thought of Sinatra as a film actor and as a singer. And I think I was fascinated by the combination of the big talent matched by an equally large personality. It's that combination that I think holds our interest. And then on a whole other level, which perhaps we'll get into, I, I came to feel that Sinatra at his peak was in a way emblematic of the United States as a culture. So factor in all of those elements, and that's why I wanted to write about him. Well, it's interesting you said that your analysis of Sinatra's early popularity in the movies is centered around the emerging middle class after World War II. You suggested that he started out playing himself, a nice young man, soft-spoken, courteous, shy with women, never a rich boy. Why did that image appeal so much to post-World War II America? Well, I think one of my jokes is the fact that Sinatra could play a shy, soft-spoken boy next door shows that he really could act <laughs> because he, he was a lot more complicated than that. But he was as, and you know, the film career started, was an outgrowth, of course, of the singing. And he was at the beginning, a reassuring presence, particularly to his female fans. And he was still on the home front during the Second World War, while their boyfriends and husbands were overseas. And there's Frank singing about lost love. And his film career really start his first feature film he did as you said he played himself he played a character called frank sinatra in a film called higher and higher and he was it turned out fantastic on camera you know what makes a star there are many many great actors but what makes a star is the camera has to love them yeah and and so sinatra with his cheekbones and the blue eyes he just registered on camera you with a real star you're as an audience member we all have the feeling of what's he thinking what's what's going to happen next what is going on in their brain and 
even playing himself, not a fictional character. That's how Sinatra registered. And uh, an anecdote about that first film that I really loved is that the late, great Rosemary Clooney, fantastic singer, she was a Bobby Soxer at the time, and she was in love with Frank Sinatra, and she said she saw Higher and Higher 17 times. She just had to watch Frank Sinatra on a movie screen. And then, of course, the film career took off, and he started to make those great MGM musicals with Gene Kelly. You wrote that Sinatra proudly emphasized his Italian heritage and changed the on-screen image of Italian Americans, especially in the role of Maggio in From Here to Eternity. But he had widespread support across a variety of ethnic groups, didn't he? He he absolutely did. And I think that's one reason why he became such an important figure is that he started by changing the image of Italians on screen and I'm half Italian. So I'm, you know, very aware or sensitive of those things. And and on screen image of Italian Americans was literally the organ grinder with a monkey, you know, a very stereotypical and every, all the Italians talked like this. uh, And there's Frank Sinatra who, when they told him to change his name, said, I'm not changing my name. I am proud of being Frank Sinatra of Italian heritage. And so he connected first with the Italian community, but then because he was such a, an urban image and proudly ethnic, he really connected with immigrants of all stripes. And that really exploded his popularity. They, they recognized his persona on the screen as a part of themselves. Now, as we all know, in 1954, Frank Sinatra won an Oscar for Best Supporting Actor for his portrayal of Maggio in From Here to Eternity. That performance was widely considered to be the greatest comeback in motion picture history. But why did Sinatra fall into disfavor with movie audiences in the first place? I mean, in the mid-40s, he was the most popular film star in the world. The rise, fall, and rise of Frank Sinatra is one of the all-time great show business stories. And I think what happened, we've alluded to the rise, but the fall came when, after the war, the Bobby Soxer fans of his were older and raising families. They were not going to the concerts and screaming their heads off. And his Hollywood trouble started when he made a wisecrack about the head of MGM, Louis B. Mayer, and it got back to Louis B. Mayer. And he called Sinatra into his office and he said, that's it, you're done, you're out of here. And so he lost his recording contract because of decreasing sales. He lost his MGM contract. And then on top of it all, that's when he met Ava Gardner. And by his own admission, He was so in love with Ava Gardner. He said it was the only time in his life he did not pay attention to his career. That's how obsessed he was with Ava. And so all of that combined into he was nowhere. And he became obsessed with playing the role of Maggio. And his great quotation was, I see Maggio every morning when I shave. He saw Maggio in the mirror. And, you know, it was... Ava, who was so instrumental in actually in getting Sinatra the the role and another great part of his legend, because he Frank had nothing to do. He was hanging out on Ava's movie set in Africa when she was making Mogambo. So what happened was he was sending telegrams to Harry Cohn, the head of Columbia. They didn't want Sinatra for the role. He flew in from Africa, which in those days was a. 30 hour trip on his own dime to audition, even though he had already made 20 films by that point. Of course, it turned out it wasn't on his own dime. It was on Ava's dime because Frank was broke, owed the IRS money. So Ava funded the trip without her knowing about it. And he came to Hollywood and he auditioned. Uh, You can watch the screen test online. People should do that. It's really great. And he improvised a scene They still wanted Eli Wallach, who said, no, I'm going to do a Tennessee Williams play instead. And that's when Ava stepped in and she got in touch with Harry Cohn and she said, listen to me. Because Ava was the bigger star at the point. 
And Ava said to Harry Cohn, listen to me, there's only one man who can play the role of Maggio, and it's the SOB I'm married to. Give him the role. It, it's what made me fall in love with her. I mean, <laughs> she was pretty great. And of course, he played the role, won the Oscar. And then, that was when he became Frank Sinatra, the superstar whom we all think about today. Oh, yes, absolutely. It is a remarkable story. Now, you ranked his best three movies as From Here to Eternity, The Manchurian Candidate, and The Man with the Golden Arm. It's fascinating to me, Tom, that Frank Sinatra didn't sing in any of those films because it was his singing and dancing that got him into the movies. I just loved him in On the Town, for example. Right. Those great, I call them the sailor suit musicals with Gene Kelly, right? Take me out to the ball game, On the Town, Anchors Away. They're just so filled with joy and sort of that 1940s technicolor exuberance. But Sinatra wanted, he didn't want to be pigeonholed, you know, as only in sailor suit musicals. And because he was so, when he sang, he was acting those lyrics. So he, he had the dramatic actor in him right from the beginning. And it really comes out in those films, you, those three films you mentioned. And you, you see his performance as a drug addict in The Man with the Golden Arm, and you just think, this guy's amazing. He did the withdrawal scene in one take. They just filmed it once. One of the points I make in the book is that those were all at his peak, kind of the mid 50s to the early 60s. And he was really, put aside the singing, as an actor, he was really Marlon Brando's only rival for the biggest roles. Sinatra wanted Brando's role in On the Waterfront. Brando wanted Sinatra's role in The Man with the Golden Arm. And they worked together only once on Guys and Dolls. And as I like to say, that was not a happy set. But of course, it makes great showbiz stories. So, Well, it's interesting that you mentioned Brando and Guys and Dolls. In my opinion, that was a disaster because Brando couldn't sing. Right. He could, he, he, great as he was as an actor, he really could not sing. And the irony, of course, is that Brando playing Sky Masterson gets to sing the big number, Luck Be a Lady, which kind of just lies there because he, he's not a singer. And that Luck Be a Lady became a staple of Sinatra concerts for decades. So, you know, I, I, the great, I, the story I love to tell is that towards the end of Frank's life, he did something he never used to do, which is he would look back over his life and watch his old movies. Because he was a man that always wanted to know what's next, what's next. But towards the end of his life, he would watch his old movies. And one day, he, uh, his daughter Tina came over to the house and together they watched Guys and Dolls. And after Brando finished singing Luck Be a Lady, Frank turned to Tina and he said, the guy still can't sing. <laughs> and <laughs> which I just love. <laughs> That's priceless. <laughs> now, many people may not know that in the 50s, Sinatra had a TV deal for 36 weeks, but ABC canceled him after 26 weeks. You wrote in the book that Sinatra and television were a bad match from the start because in those days, Americans did not want TV with an edge and Sinatra was all edge. What did you mean by that? Well, I think that television is a very intimate medium. And, you know, it's you alone in your living room watching the screen. Think back to the 50s is what I'm talking about, you know, when... Uh, television was new. And people wanted to relax into the television. It was, they were welcoming a friend into their house. It's why Perry Como did so well on television. He was so low key and relaxed. But with Frank, who was such an edgy, volatile personality, when I watched those shows, I, I felt like Frank was going to jump through the screen. You know, it, it was like it couldn't contain him. He, his personality was wrong for a weekly show. Is that Whereas, because he didn't look at ease on television in those days? He looked impatient. 
Like, I need to get this over with, what's next? And that does not work on television. Whereas his great friend, Dean Martin, was a huge success on television because he was the essence of being a relaxed, genial host. And, but uh, by way of contrast, Dean Martin, who could act, was never the film star that Frank was. So, you know, the, the personalities suit the different mediums in, you know, in different ways. I think Frank Sinatra was more of an event and that it was wrong to expect him to be able to deliver every week on television, yes. you know, not just because he wasn't relaxed, but to me, he was like Judy Garland. These are not people that you deserve to see every week. They, they're, they're an event. I, I think that's a great way of phrasing it. They were an event. And that's why Sinatra's, where he did work well on television, were his musical specials. One hour, once a year, you know, he did the A Man and His Music, which was fantastic because it was an event and it was only once. So, yeah, you're onto something there, I think. Even though his TV show in the 50s wasn't a big success, he had numerous radio shows in the 40s and was a huge success on the radio, though, wasn't he? He was. He was a very big success. And that's because Frank would come in and just stand before the mic and sing. You know, it was what he loved doing. He didn't have to worry about the camera angles, rehearsals. He was a very impatient guy. And so radio suited him that way very well. I love your analysis of the public's fascination with the Rat Pack. You called it a case of arrested development because by the 60s, the American dream that Sinatra represented was fading. What's the connection between the American dream and the cool swagger of the Rat Pack? Well, I think the Rat Pack continues to fascinate because, it, it, one, as one commentator said, it's the Mount Rushmore of men having fun. It, it's a, right? It's kind of a protracted adolescence. They're playing. They're just having a great time, which is what you do when you're 16 years old. You're not used to seeing it in 40-year-old men. And I think people weighted down with their daily responsibilities of going to work, raising the kids, you know, running the house, paying the bills. They looked at Frank and Dean and they were like, I want that. I want to be a kid with no responsibilities. And it was very interesting that decades later, to refer again to our friend Rosemary Clooney, she, when her, George Clooney is Rosemary's nephew, and she was observing George and his pals. This is long before George settles down with his wife, but he's an adult and the pals, they're playing basketball in the driveway. And she said, they're the new version of the Rat Pack. Like, when are they going to grow up? So it, it and, you know, we all have a little bit of envy of that when we don't feel like dealing with our everyday responsibilities. And there's Frank, you know, those guys, he slept, I don't know, three hours a, a day because they would sing all night in the in the nightclubs. And at those times there were still, you know, midnight shows. And then they would carouse and then sleep for a couple of hours, get up and fly in a helicopter to their film location. They never stopped. Well, did you like the Rat Pack movies? I thought they were silly. Well, I think they were, they started out well with Ocean's Eleven. That's just a fun movie, a caper movie. And there's a reason why George Clooney has made four of them, because they're either three or four, because the central idea is a lot of fun. But after that, yes, they degenerated into silliness and they weren't much. You know, you would get a moment or two that was fun but that that was really it. The only other one that still has some entertainment value is Robin in the Seven Hoods. And that's just because to see Frank sing Chicago, my kind of town, I'll pay money to see that. But the other ones, yes, you're right. A lot of silliness in things like Sergeants 3 and no point. Now, Frank Sinatra won an Oscar for From Here to Eternity and was nominated for an Oscar for The Man with the Golden Arm. And he won two Golden Globes for Pal Joey and From Here to Eternity and a Golden Globe nomination for Come Blow Your Horn. 
and he won the Cecil B. DeMille Award and two BAFTA Award nominations. So he certainly got his share of accolades for acting. But do you think that he was generally underappreciated as an actor by the industry and by the critics? Oh, that's such an interesting question. I, I think people acknowledged his huge talent as an actor, but I think it was overshadowed by the incredible musical career. And I think that was one of the reasons I wanted to write the book. I thought, let's separate out Sinatra, the recording artist, and let's just look at the fact of it's one of the greatest legacies in Hollywood history. He probably made 10 or 12 really first rate movies. And his, I mean, there was a lot of junk as there was for all stars of those days who work constantly, but that's a significant legacy. And his, his acting is, it's just so gut level instinctual with him that I think people have come to appreciate him as an actor more as the years have gone by. I do too. I was surprised to learn from your book that Sinatra's first choice to play the mother in The Manchurian Candidate was Lucille Ball, yeah. but Angela Lansbury got the part. So I want to ask you, Tom, do you think Lucy could have carried off that part as well as Angela Lansbury did? Well, I don't, I don't know that Lucy would have been as good as Angela because that is one great performance. And to me, the benchmark is, I think Angela's performance in that role has it all over Meryl Streep's performance in the remake. I mean, that's how good Angela was. She was scary. I think Lucy could have played the role because think about it, as Lucille Ball aged and she would have been older making the mentoring candidate, she was pretty tough. I mean, that was a tough show business persona. And if she had been willing, she had a great director, you know, John Frankenheimer on that film. If she had been willing to dig, she would, she would have, pulled off the role. But Angela is fantastic in that role. Anybody listening, watch The Manchurian Candidate. Not the remake with Meryl and Denzel, but the original with Angela and Frank Sinatra. I agree. It's a chilling performance. Now, for me, when I think of Frank Sinatra, it's very hard to separate Sinatra, the movie star, from Sinatra, the singer. I'm one of those fans who loved him the most when he was singing. Is he your favorite male vocalist? Oh, hands down. Unquestioned. I'm, a, I'm kind of fanatical about him. You know, I, I would say to you, this sounds like hyperbole, but it's true. Not a day goes by when at some point during the day or the night, I li don't listen to Frank Sinatra. Really? Day. Yeah. That's how much as, because what, I mean, I just love the sound of it, but the great, great thing about Frank Sinatra when he's singing, I say in the book, he was not just singing to us. He was singing about us. He, his choice of songs and the way he could act out those lyrics, he was saying to us, this is what the journey through life is. There are going to be great moments and there are going to be obstacles that you can't believe have come your way. And it's a voice of understanding on this journey we all take together. And I think that's why he speaks to me uh, so directly. And then, you know, it, that what I'm talking about, of course, is all summed up in the song, That's Life. That, that sums up it all because we've all been up and down and over and round. And uh, when to have him, you, you feel like they, uh, there's somebody who understands. That's somebody who gets it. And I think if I can just go on a little bit about that, because it's one of my points in the book. Sinatra as a vocalist, as an actor, there is a duality about him that fascinates. And so as a vocalist, you see... When Frank Sinatra, he made albums that I call his Technicolor albums that speak to our great joy in life. I've got the world on a string, excl exclamation point. Songs for swinging lovers, exclamation point. So you feel great in your life and there's Frank singing about it. But the flip side of that is when Frank made what I call his film noir albums, Only the Lonely in the wee small hours of the morning. And we all have those moments that I call the 
two AMs of the soul. When you things aren't going right, you feel alone. And there's Frank singing about that. So you get the two sides, just as in his film career, you had those great sailor suit musicals with Gene Kelly. But the flip side of those are it, the man with the golden arm, right? And suddenly where he plays the presidential assassin, the dark sides, and that's what had happened in the world. We were the world's good guy after World War II. We were gonna make the world safe for democracy, everybody said. But the flip side of that was, of course, that the bomb existed and we could be blown into oblivion. And so that duality informs, I believe, both his singing and his acting, and it's why it still works so well today. My favorite Sinatra album is the Live at the Sands with Count Basie. Oh, it's fantastic. You have, you're a man of great taste, Harvey. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great, great album. And I would only sum that up by saying in, in Vanity Fair magazine on uh, the back page, they have the Proust questionnaire where they take a celebrity and they ask all sorts of questions about if you came back what in reincarnation, who would you be and things like that. And one month, the, per, the subject of the Proust questionnaire was the amazing Quincy Jones. And this man who has done everything as a musician and they said to Quincy Jones, when have you been happiest in your entire life? And his answer was conducting the Count Basie Orchestra for Frank Sinatra in Las Vegas. Wow. Yeah. So you, you, that, that's my way of saying you picked a great recording as your favorite. Oh, wow. Well, it, because it made me feel like I was in the audience. What about you? Do you have a favorite Sinatra album? Or does do. it depend on your mood? Well, I think, oh, that's good. I think it does depend on the mood. But I think generally my very favorite one is A Swing and Affair because it just makes me feel great. It, it, anybody out there who wants to be cheered up and feel happy, play Frank Sinatra, Swing and Affair. And, you know, he had impeccable tastes in songs. So he he's singing Cole Porter and Gershwin. And when you hear Frank Sinatra on that album sing at Long Last Love, I just always think, well, it doesn't get better than this. I, I'm, I'm taking this. <laughs> so, Tom, what do you think of the current singers that are in the same style as Sinatra's, like Michael Buble? I happen to be a big fan of Michael Buble's because I think he has a great voice. And I, I think... The best are people like Michael Buble or a Harry Connick who are in the style of Sinatra, but try to put their own spin on it, where, as opposed to the people that do tribute shows where they are literally just imitating him step by step. I, th I think the only problem is when, you know, a great as I think Michael Buble is, sometimes the arrangements are really so similar to Frank's. And I think that's a little tricky because Buble is losing a little of his individuality, but I think he's a great talent and I certainly enjoy listening to him. So I, I think draw on the roots as inspiration, just don't do a slavish imitation. Now your book deals with more than just Sinatra's film career. I found the discussion of his relationship with the Kennedys to be really sad. Sinatra was supporting JFK in his candidacy for president, but JFK snubbed Sinatra by not showing up when he was invited to Sinatra's home in Palm Springs for the weekend. Apparently, Robert Kennedy talked his brother out of getting too close to Sinatra because of his supposed ties to the mafia. Do you think the Kennedys were justified in distancing themselves from Sinatra? Oh, that's such a complicated question. I think because it involves matters of friendship and loyalty that Sinatra had been instrumental in helping JFK get elected. And at the same time, Bobby Kennedy was uh, sensitive about the supposed mafia ties. I think it's a, it was a turning point in Frank Sinatra's life. I think it was a turning point because he felt that there had been a betrayal of friendship. And I think it really was the turning point in his turn to the right politically. Remember when Frank Sinatra was young, he was an outspoken Democrat. His idol was Franklin Roosevelt 
our president. And by the end of Frank Sinatra's life, he was a very staunch Ronald Reagan conservative. And I think the Sinatra episode when uh, JFK did not go to Frank's house and instead went to the home of the conservative Republican Bing Crosby, that really was difficult for Frank Sinatra to accept. It was never the same after that. You wrote that Frank's public image changed from being the struggling outsider from Hoboken to a member of the privileged class after he became a staunch Republican. But it didn't hurt his popularity, did it? No, it's just people looked at Frank through a different prism with that knowledge of his personal life. But he was still Frank Sinatra. And in terms of his popularity, one thing that fascinated me that I wanted to look at in the book is he is the only popular star that I know of who started out with a predominantly female fan base, the Bobby Soxers, who went to his concerts in the 40s, who loved hearing him sing, you know, those, those ballads of longing, and ended up with a predominantly male fan base who came to his concerts to hear Frank Sinatra sing My Way. That journey in his fan base, nobody else has ever duplicated. That's quite fascinating. I'd never thought of that. Yeah, it, it was, I mean, he kept his female fans, but the hardcore Sinatra fans were men who wanted to f- hear Frank sing My Way because that spoke to something in their lives that they wanted. And they wanted to think they had done things their way, whether they had or not. But there was Frank on stage saying, this is the way it is. And Frank himself had a love-hate relationship with the song. He knew he had to sing it because it meant so much to his fans. But he always was a little uncomfortable. He felt the lyrics were a little bit on the braggart side. So that, again, there's the duality in Frank. That's why I find him so interesting. Well, another thing that I find interesting that's fleshed out in your book, the whole question of whether Sinatra really was closely tied to the heads of organized crime. I mean, on the one hand, the mob ran nearly all of the top nightclubs in the 40s and 50s where Sinatra performed. And he definitely knew people like Lucky Luciano and Sam Giancana. And there was his ill-advised trip to Cuba with Joe Fischetti, who was a mobster. But has there ever been any definitive proof that Sinatra was actually in business with these people? There has never been definitive proof. Speaking to that, you know, Frank Sinatra had an enormous FBI file. Enormous, like this thick. J. Edgar Hoover, you know, was... Obsessed. In many ways. And obsessed. Yes, absolutely. And three quarters of Frank Sinatra's FBI files is about J. Edgar Hoover's obsession that Frank Sinatra was a communist. So right off the bat, that tells you how misguided it all was. And the, the see, the biggest rumor about Frank Sinatra is that in the mob is that the mob made him a star. They, they, you know, and, and the Godfather myth plays into this because of the famous scene with the horse's head, which was, you know, with the studio head to give a role to the Italian singer. But that was fiction made up by Mario Puzo. There was no basis for that. But the myth took hold. People wanted that larger than life myth. And what I think it really is about Sinatra is that he was not in the mafia The mob did not make him a star because his talent made him a star. If the mob could make you a star, there'd be 10 other Frank Sinatras, and there's only one. What he did do with the mob was he liked being around those guys because he loved the sense of power that they emanated. Frank Sinatra was a very powerful man who gravitated to other powerful individuals. But at the same time, the mob really liked being around Frank Sinatra because there was this world famous singer and actor. They, they wanted, it was like, they wanted his glamor to rub off on them. And to me, the one time where Frank was really involved with the mafia, and this goes back to the Kennedys and your previous question about why Frank felt so betrayed. 
During the 1960 presidential election, when JFK was still running for the Democratic nomination, the West Virginia primary was coming up. And it was a real turning point because it was when the issue of his Catholicism came to the forefront. We'd never had a Catholic president. Everybody said, oh, he's going to take orders from the Pope. You know, wacko thinking. But it was a real issue at the time. And because they were so concerned about JFK winning the West Virginia primary, Kennedy's father went to Sinatra. This is fact. I'm not spinning tales. And he said, can you help and speak to Sam Giancana, the mob boss, about turning out the vote? And Sinatra went. He spoke to Giancana. The vote was turned out. JFK won the West Virginia primary and, of course, went on to win the election and become our president. And he and Sinatra, there was a, a great friendship there. It started to turn sour because Giancana and his mob cohorts thought, we're, we're golden now. We helped him get elected. They're going to leave us alone. The Justice Department is not going to come after us. And, of course, Bobby Kennedy, as attorney general, went right after the mob, which infuriated the mobsters. So there's this intersection, right, of Hollywood power at the highest level, Washington, D.C. And the capper to the story, which I think speaks to all the rumors about Sinatra, is that there are tapes that exist where you can hear Sam Giancana and his associates talking about Sinatra. And far from saying that, oh, he's one of us, you hear one of the associates, he doesn't use these words, but he's basically saying to Giancana, this all went so wrong, the Justice Department is after us, do you want us to take care of Sinatra? In other words, yeah, they're saying that about Frank. And Sam Giancana says, no, I have other plans for Frank. And what those plans were, were that Giancana controlled a nightclub outside of Chicago called the, uh, I think it was the Villa, Villa Venice, some, some variation of that. And what his plans were, Frank, were Frank and Dean Martin played two weeks at the Villa Venice for free. So it, it, it's an amazing story, but it speaks to the point of if Frank were in cahoots with the mob, they would not be talking about, you know, do you want me to take care of him? It, so it's, it, it's an intersection of, of myth and reality overlaid with the whole issue of the stereotypical image of Italians. They think anybody whose last name ends in a vowel is a member of the mob. Yeah. So, and, and, you know, that, that's something I'm aware of and, and wanted to look at in the book. So I wanted that to give the book, a, besides the show business stories of Frank and Marlon Brando fighting, which are just fun to read about, I wanted to give the book another level of, of that sort of discourse. I, I hope I did. You know, I wanted it to be a fun read, but some substance to it. Well, you absolutely did. And you made a really strong point in your book, Tom, when you said that if Sinatra was truly one of them, one of the mafia, where were they in 1951 and 52 when his career was at an all-time low? Right, exactly. That's a, I'm glad you brought that up. That speaks to my point of if they had that power and if Frank really were that involved with the mob, then why weren't there 10 other Frank Sinatras who were huge recording and film stars? His talent made him a star. That overwhelming talent is what we've just never had anybody quite like him since. Well, then here's the thing. I know that Sinatra deeply resented being accused of having mob connections because he said so on TV in a CBS interview in 1965. Mm -hmm. But what I could never understand was why he was such good friends with comedians like Don Rickles, who constantly referred to Sinatra's mob connections in their comedy acts. Didn't Sinatra realize that those comments were only solidifying his reputation as being closely connected to the mob? That is a very good question. I think Frank was okay with that because those comments were coming from his friends. They were not coming from adversaries in the press or in Congress or whoever it was. And he knew they were joking with him. And I, I think on some level, he felt 
I actually think he felt that those sort of barbs in front of him when Frank would laugh about it punctured that image of Frank being in the mob. I, I think his hope was, oh, well, if they see me laughing at it, then, you know, they'll stop thinking their substance. That, that's just my interpretation. I think it's why he was okay with it. I think if a stranger had done that at a public event, he, he would have been ballistic. But Don Rickles was a friend of his. I guess so. You talked about Sinatra's marriages in the book. He was one of the few Hollywood stars who remained friends with his ex-wives, Nancy, Ava Gardner, Mia Farrow. That's very telling about his personality, isn't it? It, it, it is. It's, I, I just find that incredibly interesting, that he was clearly uh, involved with many women, you know, uh, but he was able to maintain his friendship with his ex-wife. So his first wife, Nancy, was the mother of his three children. So he wanted to maintain that relationship. And that, that was a close relationship throughout his entire life. Ava, he left his first wife for Ava, and they are like characters out of an opera. Their emotions are so larger than life. And you know, that's a case of they couldn't live with each other and they couldn't live without each other. But the telling point is that when she became sick at the end of her life, Frank paid almost all of her hospital bills. And then he and Mia Farrow, even after they got divorced, they would speak so frequently, that constant communication. So that's interesting uh, that he, he was not good at marriage, but he could be good at friendship. And I think Frank Sinatra is an example of somebody who was a better father than he was husband. Well, he married his last wife, Barbara Marks, in 1976. His daughter, Tina, said that finally Frank Sinatra had married his mother. What do you <laughs> what a thing to say? What do you think she meant by that? I know that makes me laugh every time I hear it. I'm glad you brought that up. I think what she meant is that Frank's mother, Dolly, was a gregarious, very tough customer. And I think his last wife, Barbara, underneath, she was a beautiful woman. I interviewed her when her book came out and she was, I would say stunning, but she was tough. You know, she was a survivor. She knew what she needed to do to get along. So I think Tina was referring to that similar strain between the two. And the great, oh, there are two great comments about Frank's mother, Dolly. She deserves a book on her own. And the first thing is one commentator said, nobody ever told Frank Sinatra what to say or what to do except his mother. I can and, relate. Uh, uh, right? I think that's universal. Uh, uh, that's all of us. And I think uh, the second really interesting comment came from Nancy Sinatra Jr. You know, these boots are made for walking. And she said about Frank, Frank's relationship with Dolly, she said, they loved each other so much and they squabbled every single day. I can and relate. Then, yeah. So there you go. Well, see, yeah. It, it, and, and, that sort of complicated relationship. See, it fueled Frank. And that this in, he not only had the talent, but you have to have the drive, right? The, har it, the hardest part is not making it, it's sustaining it after you make it. That's the hardest part. And there was an element in Frank Sinatra's life when he announced uh, at age 15 or 16, you know, he dropped out of high school, even though he was bright, he was not, he didn't want to be in a classroom. And he announced to his parents that he was going to be a singer. And the reaction of his two parents were, his father said to him, you're going to be a bum. And his mother threw a shoe at his head. And so he was determined to prove them wrong. And that, that gave him that fuel. It's just like, Barbara Streisand's mother saying to her, you should be a secretary in the school system. That well, sometimes it. rejection is a great motivator. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and so I think, you know, Sinatra was close to, uh, to his parents, but at the same time, their initial lack of support gave him the engine to the drive to succeed. 
Well, Tom, as usual, you provide so much information and insight in your interviews. I think your book is a must read for every Sinatra fan. And I want to thank you so much for taking the time to come on our show. Oh, th thanks so much for having me. I, I really enjoyed this. I, I, you know, one of the things I joke about is I just am so interested by Frank Sinatra that I'll I'll go talk about him in a phone booth and if those still exist and, but to do it on your show, which is terrific is just that much better. And, and I, I thank you for giving me the time. Oh, well, the pleasure was all mine. I, I can't wait to have you back with every book you write. Well, that's awfully nice of you. Thank you. Our I guest has been Tom Santo Pietro, author of Sinatra in Hollywood, the film career of a screen icon. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Remember to subscribe to the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. And be sure to check out more great interviews with Harvey Brownstone on HarveyBrownstoneInterviews.com.